You're tuned into Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show with some information about agricultural law. And today we're going to talk about Kansas fence law. And then to talk about it, we have K-State and Washburn law professor Roger McOwen. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Good to be with you, Shelby. Kansas fence law, something that often gets talked about. And the first point that we wanted to talk about on this was the location of the fence. Yeah, Shelby, I'd say when it comes down to questions that I feel and I feel that over the past three decades, uh, outside of tax and estate planning, business planning, those types of issues, fences and leases are running a close second, third in terms of predominance of questions. And with respect to location of a fence, now normally a fence would be on the surveyed boundary. Well, that's not always the case in, in ag. Of course, it is in town. But uh, we've got a rule in uh, rural areas, uh, rural parts of the state for farmland and ranch land, that location of the fence may actually determine the actual boundary of the property, particularly if that particular location has been treated as the boundary for a long enough period of time. Then the survey really doesn't matter because it's the way it's been farmed on each side or grazed on each side. It may have been placed in that particular area as what we call a fence of convenience. Well, that can be in certain situations. A fence of convenience can end up being the actual location of the boundary to that property. So we get into a bunch of issues in ag with respect to such things as adverse possession or the doctrine of practical location. But if we start with the basic principle, you want to have a survey done, get the fence on the survey boundary and start from that point moving forward. But we do, we just need to recognize in ag that there are many situations where we may have a fence that's not on the actual property boundary. And it, it can become the legal boundary to those adjacent tracks. Interesting information there. And for that fence that is hopefully on that boundary, if not close to it, if it's not in good condition, how does that go about getting repaired, especially if two different people are dealing with it? Yeah, let's say that we remove the question of where the location of the fence is. And so that's not an issue. But what the issue is that we've got a fence or we want to build a fence on the boundary and what both parties agree where the boundary is, or there is an existing fence and it needs repaired. Well, how do you determine who does what? In common uh, practical application in ag, we tend to follow what's known as the right-hand rule. Let's say that you and I, Shelby, are are adjoining property owners, and and we've got a dilapidated fence between us. And you approach me and say, uh, boy, I know you know, under Kansas fence law, we're each responsible for building and maintaining half the fence. Why don't we meet midpoint of the fence facing each other and we each fix what's on our right-hand side? So you fix what's to your right, I fix what's to my right. And that's that's generally what's done in many situations in ag. Now, sometimes people reverse it and they use the left-hand rule, but usually the right-hand rule is utilized. Now, that's not in the statute. That's just commonly what's done in many situations. Well, let's say that we can't agree on that, maybe because when you propose that to my right, uh, immediately from the midpoint is thick brush, there's rocks, there's water to cross, and it's not a flat grade. And then as you face me to your right, oh, it's clean level pasture, there's no brush, there's no trees, there's no water, there's no rock, and it's deep topsoil. And so the cost to you and the time commitment is much less than it is for me. I've got a disaster. So I say, no, I don't want, I don't want to use the right-hand rule. So we can't come to an agreement. Well, then what we have to do in that situation is we have to call the fence viewers out. And those are the county commissioners. And there's another part of the statute that says, or any two of them can serve as the fence viewers in that situation. So they come out, they make a view, and they are the ones that will determine who's responsible for what portion of the fence. And so really just helping people come to that agreement if it's not able to be made? Well, yeah, and we get into situations where let's say they come out and uh, you call them out, they come out, make a view, and they allocate responsibility, and I don't like it. So I say, well, I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Well, then what you can do is inform the fence viewers that I'm not going to participate And then you can seek authorization from them to build the whole fence and then later be reimbursed by it. So they authorize you. They come out, make a second view. They say, okay, you repair the fence. And then before you can submit your bill to me, you have to call them out a third time for them to review the situation and certify your bill before you can send it to me. So really, and that and that whole process of three views came out of a, a North Riley County, Kansas case about 20 years ago that went all the way through the court system in Kansas. And that again, that's not in the statute. That's a court case that uh, happened about two decades ago where we got this three view process. And that's a real hassle 
if livestock are involved because you got to have a fence to keep the animals in. But the court is saying you have to go through this process. So it can be a real pain. Bringing up livestock, especially when talking about if one side of that fence, the people have cattle and the fence needs repaired, but maybe the other side doesn't have cattle and really no livestock and don't have a need for that fence. Do they still have to contribute? Yeah, here's the other problem. Let's just throw another scenario into the example with you and I. And uh, you approach me and say, well, we need to fix this fence because you've got cows and I don't. I've got crops. And I say, well, uh, Shelby, that's fine, but this is a fence in jurisdiction. You're responsible for keeping your cows at home. You know, I don't have a record of my my corn or my soybeans or my milo or my wheat getting up and walking away in the middle of the night causing a problem. Build your fence. Leave me alone. That's not the rule because the fence statutes in Kansas have been interpreted by the attorney general to mean that in situations where the land is not used in common, in other words, you've got cattle, I've got crops, then we're each equally responsible for building and maintaining half of the total cost of that fence. So I can't get out of it in that situation. And that that really surprises some people. Um, And there's two or three times a year where I have to explain that to somebody that has called or has emailed that really can't believe that that's the rule. Uh, yeah, that's the way that's been interpreted in Kansas. We are a fence in jurisdiction, but I may have a responsibility also as a non-livestock owner to participate equally with you in building and maintaining that fence. And that's a limitation on the fence in jurisdiction, but it kind of makes sense because I'm also benefiting by your fence, if we call it your fence, because if your cows get out, They'll destroy my crops. So I have an interest in making sure that that's a good fence. That's kind of the theory that's behind it. And in a sense of keeping livestock in an area because of a fence. However, sometimes fences do go bad or something random happens and that livestock gets out on the road or is possibly causing injury or killing someone because of an accident. Yeah, that is true. And and sometimes the fence doesn't even have to be in bad shape at all. Animals are animals and bulls are bulls and they'll get out. Uh, They have a mind of their own sometime, and that is kind of the theory behind the rule that I'm going to talk about here in a second. And the rule is that the livestock owner is not presumed to be at fault if animals get out and cause injury or death, Uh, get out on a public roadway, for example. The party that's injured or the parties in a wrongful death suit have to prove that the livestock owner was negligent somehow. The burden is on them to prove their case that the animal owner was negligent. And we can have evidence of negligence in numerous ways. Uh, There was evidence that a gate was left open. There was evidence that the fence was in disrepair and the livestock owner knew it was in disrepair, or they knew they had animals get out in the recent past and hadn't done anything about it to, to fix the fence to keep them in, or they knew they needed a stronger enclosure. All those types of things can be evidence of negligence that the injured party would have to establish. Now, some states, such as Nebraska, have used what's known as the res ipsa locator doctrine, and that basically turns it around such that the livestock owner has to prove that they weren't negligent, which is a very, very difficult, if not impossible, burden, particularly if you have a good fence. Because if you have a good, solid fence and there's been no situations where the livestock have gotten out in the past, what's going to happen? You get to trial on that. You're going to get put on the stand and you're going to be asked, how'd your animals get out? I don't know. And the other party is going to turn on their heels to the court seat. Judge, see, they don't know. They can't They can't prove that they were free of negligence, therefore decide for us. It's, it's kind of a screwball doctrine in my view. And fortunately, the Kansas courts have rejected that. So the party that's injured has to establish that the livestock owner was negligent in some manner. And Roger, today we've just talked about kind of four different scenarios, but there's so much more to Kansas fence law. Oh, there's a lot more. We're not going to have time to get into what is a legal fence in terms of what can it be made of. The common ones, barbed wire fences, but you can have post and palisades and you can have rock fences and you can have hedge fences. You can have all kinds of things. And the Kansas statute is very specific when it comes to that as to what constitutes a legal fence. And even getting down to the nitty-gritty in terms of how far posts can be apart, if it's a barbed wire fence, the distance between the wires, the height of the top wire and the height of the bottom wire, it's very detailed in terms of its statutory provisions. And it's also very old. It goes back into the 1800s. Where can people find this information to read more about it? 
I have a detailed publication on Kansas fence law that's on my website, and that's washburnlaw.edu backslash Walter, W-A-L-T-R. And this one is in the articles section of my website, and this is an article I, I produced in 2016. Uh, fortunately, fence law doesn't change very much, uh, just a few cases here and there, so it's not one I have to update too frequently, but only about every decade or so. And so uh, the current version is from 2016. Roger, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some information about Kansas fence law. Thank you, Shelby. That was K-State and Washburn Law Professor Roger McOwen. You can find more work from Roger by going to washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. I will link that in today's show notes, which you can find on actday.net.